Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. Today's case needs to come with a, a huge, huge trigger warning. This is one of the most horrific cases I think I've ever heard of. Just putting yourself in the victim's shoes is, ugh. It's a gut punch for sure. Before we get started, let's take a minute to ground ourselves, get comfortable. While you do that, I have a quick message for you. I want to give a huge thank you to our sponsor today, Fume. If you are a regular Sippendale, you know how much I absolutely adore this brand. Not just what they have done for me health-wise, but just coming from like a brand side of things. As somebody who works with a lot of different brands, I, I turn down offers sometimes. They are just an absolute joy and pleasure to work with. I don't turn down offers from them, that's for dang sure. Fume is an innovative award-winning device that helps with what can be a very stressful time transitioning from breaking up with bad habits into a much more enjoyable and attainable process instead of electronics fume is completely natural instead of vapor they use flavored air and instead of harmful chemicals fume uses all natural delicious flavors mine personally is the mint the crisp mint i can taste it every time i say crisp mint now if you saw my last video that had fume sponsor it i mentioned how i thought I lost my fume, accused my sister of taking it. Turns out it was just somewhere where I put it so that I wouldn't lose it. And then I forgot about putting it in that spot entirely and temporarily lost it. Then when I had received the newest brief and I saw that they had launched a new component to the fume, the base, that's what it's called, the base. Um, I was like, wow, this... <laughs> This is going to look super staged, but it wasn't. And I didn't have the, the base at the time, okay? But fast forward days later, I'm talking days. This is just an another thing that just makes them so wonderful to work with. I'm not waiting on product. First of all, they did, after, after sending me a fume, they didn't even need to ever send me anything. They have taken such good care of my supporters that have supported them, me, my family that I accuse of stealing from me. They really just are like a pleasure to work with. And so yeah, days later, the base shows up and it's, um, it's a beauty. You know that I, 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 um, base comfort off of weight. So if you weigh a lot, you're super comfortable to me. I love a good weighted blanket. I love the fact that the fume itself has like a nice weight to it and now the base and oh baby she she is healthy it is so small but mighty i was like when i opened when i got the box i was like what is in here i always want to like try to show i i love weight i don't know what that is about about you know my comfort but i always try to like show the weight but like like that that is that's that that's a healthy L. Like the fume, it is designed to have that fidgeting aspect in mind, but still the purpose of not losing your fume and being able to like put it down, but you can still like sit there and fidget and, and play with it. And that's what I love. These products started out as a tool for me to work through you know, the hardest days of breaking a habit. And then now I hardly ever find myself needing the device for that, you know, device to um, mouth motion. And it's just kind of now turned into my little fidgety comfort cuddle bug. And now I'm so excited to have like another, another piece to everything. So just to make sense of what I'm saying, if this is completely like your first time ever seeing, <laughs> seeing this device, your fume is designed to have all of these little movable parts that actually do have a purpose, which is great. So inside you put your, you put your core in there, you close it, it's magnetic. You can adjust the airflow, but it still has like a little clicking sound, which is just really helpful. Um, I know not just for me, but for a lot of people is just kind of redirecting their stresses and anxiety. I love traveling with this because it's something that I can just Fume has served over 150,000 customers. They have thousands of success stories, 
myself included. There is no reason you also can't be one of them. You can join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. You can all also upgrade your journey pack to the Solana, which is this um, nice, sexy, darker premium wallet barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has like a little bit of a smoother finish. Just head over to tryfume.com slash Dale, or you can scan the QR code code and use my code Sherilyn Dale to get up to 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That is tryfum.com and my code Sherilyn Dale to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you so much again, Fume, for sponsoring today's video and always taking care of me. I know you absolutely do not have to do that and it, it really does mean so much to me. August 2nd, 2015 was a seemingly ordinary day in Franklin County, Ohio, and that tranquility was quickly shattered by a frantic 911 call that came in. The voice on the other line was barely able to get words out due to just trembling and sheer panic in their voice to report an unimaginable scene that was unfolding in front of her at a Speedway gas station. A young woman had been completely engulfed in flames and a man was on fire to the lower portion of his body. When officers arrived, they quickly realized this was not just some accident, minor, you know, innocent accident that happened at a gas station. It was a nightmare. Witnesses at the scene were shocked and horrified by what they had just seen, which was the man, Michael Slager, deliberately douse his girlfriend, Judy Malinowski, in gasoline in broad daylight and lit her on fire. Judy Hensel was born on August 26, 1983 to her parents Thomas Hensel and Bonnie Bowes in Columbus, Ohio. She was the oldest child with a younger brother and sister that her family said she doted on. From a very young age, Judy was a fighter and learned how to handle adversity and tragedy with grace and kindness and an open heart and that started in 1997 when she was only 13 years old and endured one of life's hardest lessons which is losing a parent her father Thomas passed and despite such a devastating loss Judy didn't let it change her upbeat friendly demeanor she is described as always having the ability to make everybody that she knew feel special and strive to make people smile and laugh with a very quick witted sense of humor she was known for being very outgoing kind and active in several social and community activities in her area she was even crowned homecoming queen at New Albany High School, which wasn't the only time that she was crowned. She also won the title of Miss New Albany, something that her mom felt she won not only because of her outer beauty, but her inner beauty and her heart and soul as well. After Judy graduated in 2001, she went on to attend Ohio State, Ohio, look at me with the accents. Ohio State University and at 21 she married a man named Ron Melanowski who she had two daughters with and people who knew Judy said she was just one of those women who was born to be a mother. Her daughters were her world and it is something that she might have not had the opportunity to have if she didn't have children at the time that she did because not long after she became a mom she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer she was able to beat her cancer with treatment, but unfortunately in 2006, it returned when she was only 23 years old. So at this point, doctors decided that Judy needed a full hysterectomy to prevent the cancer from returning. And obviously, battling cancer is challenging enough but on top of that stress she also became dependent and addicted to the pain medication she was being prescribed during her recovery her marriage also ended in divorce with her husband being unfaithful during this time so there was a lot going on here and something that I think is really important to be aware of is I think so often that when we think of people who are addicted to drugs that you just kind of instinctually go to oh they you know they decided to like dabble into too much partying and it got out of hand and then you know they've they've chosen these hardships of addiction based 
on putting themselves in those situations. And first off, (laughs) that's generally not what happens. Second, addiction has so many different layers to it and so many things that contribute to it to lead that person into the position that they're in. And I never understood that until I myself was recovering from a surgery. I was prescribed a heavy narcotic I took my doses didn't think anything of it it was just like okay these are the doses I take it is what it is and when the last pill of the bottle was there I was like okay sweet after this we're done and I'm moving on from that part of my recovery and let me tell you that first night was absolute hell and I was like that for about a week and it wasn't like my mind it was my body like my body was losing its mind because it was wanting more not me I was like we're cool we're going we're going on to the next stage here and it it was my body and that made that gave me such a realization because I was like wow I was only on this for a week and those weren't even drugs that are as high of a dose as the level that I I hear a lot of people become addicted to. So that opened my eyes so much to how this has happened. So I can't imagine what Judy was going through with her level of surgery and pain medication. And this isn't something that, you know, she chose for herself. And again, that's such a misconception. I, I don't believe that anybody wants to deal with that pain in their life and struggle. So I I can't imagine what she went through. And while she's fighting through her health issues and overcoming addiction and, and a divorce, she had reached out to a man named Michael Slager, who was a construction worker. He was eight years older than her and I believe was an acquaintance of her ex-husband so they became friends and she kind of leaned on him for comfort and friendship and opened up that you know she was in a vulnerable state with you know her heart because of everything that had gone on in her marriage and I guess their relationship was complicated they were friends but the more they hung out the stronger the feelings became primarily on Michael's part and he confessed that he was in love with her which further complicated things because I guess he was also dating other women some of which I think knew Judy and then there was a period of time where they didn't really talk much because Michael went to prison it's not really clear to me if Judy knew why but Michael definitely had a lengthy criminal history with some very concerning charges. He had multiple convictions for domestic violence, assault, aggravated, menacing, sexual battery, stalking, making false police reports, rape, petty theft, endangering children, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, failure to register as a sex offender, and obstructing official businesses. Again, we don't know if Judy ever knew what those charges were. And around this time that he had gone back to prison, she's also dealing with demons in her life, I want to say, because that's what it feels like, I think. She no longer had access to her health insurance, and so she wasn't able to afford to see a doctor to get her medication, and that led her down a path of unfortunately using heroin and becoming addicted to it. So her mom, Bonnie, stepped in and started taking care of Judy's two little girls while Judy went to a private rehab center to help her. After getting sober, Judy was able to start living her life again, living with her daughters, and she was doing a lot better. That is until Michael was released from prison and reached out to Judy on Facebook and they eventually started to chat, reconnect, and started dating. Like I said, we have no idea if Judy knew about his record. Sadly, if she wasn't aware prior to dating, she definitely found out for herself what his true colors were shortly after they started seeing each other because he started to abuse Judy. Her mom said she saw bruises on her face and eventually Judy confided in her sister that he had been harming her and even choked her when he was angry. From here, it wasn't long until Judy relapsed. This is something her family strongly believe Michael encouraged 
so that he had more control over Judy. And based on their accounts of that situation in a whole, I, I, I can understand why they felt that way. Judy claimed that Michael, he didn't do drugs but he bought them for her. He supplied them every single day. And that can definitely be a, ta a tactic for somebody to have something over your head and control you, making you more vulnerable in a worse place in, in your life and depending on them. This relationship was beyond toxic. During a two-month period of May to July 2015, the police had received 13 phone calls either from Judy or from Michael. Most of them were actually made by Michael and he would report things like, oh, she took my car without asking. We got in an argument and, and she's off and then wouldn't press charges. And the calls from Judy were calls that like he, she thought that Michael was quite literally going to kill her and feared for her life. And when she spoke to friends about it, she got the impression that because of her situation, her complaints really weren't taken seriously. They didn't really do much to help her because the, you know, the misconception was like, oh, okay, well, she's she's an addict so she must put herself in these situations i don't know how many times we've talked about cases where that just my blood starts to boil because yeah to to think of somebody less than because of struggles in their life just whew, sets me off there have been investigators who looked into the some of those calls and records and believed that judy was too scared to offer help that was offered to her that there was help offered sometimes when she called but she was terrified of what michael would do to her if he found out that she was talking to police which also could be true and something that i could emphasize em empathize with come on Sherilyn. the fact that he was calling the police more than her and that she was calling and that she was fearful did it, sh it showed me actually how diabolical he was because he was using those calls to control her even more which is something that I've personally experienced this level of intimidation and control except for he told me he had like family working in homicide and private investigators that were you know available 24 7 to you know for his phone calls so he he Michael I could see easily feel that he could manipulate the situation by having them come in and just spin the narrative that you know she's she's some delinquent who's taken off with his property or whatever he's saying in these different calls and that the police would show up and have a record of her being the one that's like over the top and dramatic and this thieving girlfriend who's struggling with addiction. So on August 2nd, 2015, Judy learns that a rehab center close by had a bed that was available for her and she asked Michael to take her there. He dropped her off at the facility and drives off, but soon had turned around and gone back. And when he had got back, he sees that Judy is still outside having a cigarette. And she actually hadn't gone in yet because she wanted to call her mom and talk to her mom and her daughters before she had checked herself in. And he pulls up and ends up losing his mind, telling her to get into the truck, believing maybe that she was going to go off and not actually go in. And he drives her to the gas station and says that he did this so that Judy could buy cigarettes. Judy says this entire time that he's driving to the gas station, he is just, he's extremely upset, losing his mind on her. And when he got out to go inside the store to buy the cigarettes, she snuck out of the truck and hid behind the back of the building. I guess there was this kind of kind of like a green patch behind there and she just went there to sit down for a second collect herself and as she's doing that he flies around the back of the building in his truck he sees Judy jumps out and just starts screaming at her he's berating her for about 10 minutes until Judy just cannot take it anymore and she has a cup of pop and she just throws it at him and he goes off the rails and just does the unimaginable he ran around to the back of his truck grabbed a can of gasoline and started coming towards judy and she's screaming trying to plead with him and falls 
to the ground. Michael continues walking towards Judy and just starts pouring the gasoline over the top of her head while she's screaming, begging him to stop. As she's screaming, she's getting gasoline poured down her throat. And he just says things to her like, you want to throw something at me? This is what I'm going to do to you, B. How do you like this? Like, freaking sick. Jurassic jail. Jurassic jail. This, this is why we need Jurassic jail. After he poured gasoline all over Judy. He backs away for about 30 seconds while Judy is still pleading with him to help her, promising him that she'll get back in to the truck and leave with him. And Michael just pulls a lighter out of his pocket and starts walking towards Judy. Judy's crying, begging for help unable to get up because she's having problems with her shoe from tripping and Michael leans down and lights Judy on fire and instantly her entire body is engulfed in flames. She's screaming, begging him for help and then her vision goes and then the last thing she remembers seeing is just him staring at her with this evil stare stare and she's trying everything to get this fire out rolling on the grass trying to take her sweater off and it didn't take long until she just blacked out it was hours later after judy blacked out that she miraculously woke up in the hospital in critical condition and finds out that there were witnesses who had seen everything and called 911 and told police that Michael had deliberately done this to her. These witnesses also told the police that after Michael had poured gasoline on Judy, he walked back to his truck and looked like he was gonna leave and they're standing frozen in shock and just see him like stomp over to her and light her on fire. And it wasn't until these witnesses started screaming and panicking for everybody to call 911 that he realizes that people had seen what just happened and he runs and gets a fire extinguisher to, to put the flames out and he had minor burns on the lower portion of his body while he was trying to put out the flames and he unfortunately was able to make a full recovery while Judy was left in utter hell but him putting them out is you know or attempting to put them out will come into play in a quick second here. I just want to touch on what Judy went through and why it was such a miracle that she had even woken up that day. She had third and fourth degree burns covering over 90% of her body. It was so devastating that her family was actually sat down and warned by the doctor prior to going into the room and seeing her for the first time that they were not going to recognize Judy. Judy had lost her ears, her fingers on her left hand, most of her vision, all of her hair. And when Judy's sister saw her for the first time, she said she had actually, she'd been sick, she had vomited, and because of the shock, she almost passed out. That being said, her family's also dealing with this emotion of thankfulness like relief that she they were looking at her and she was alive in in these conditions and initially doctors had said that the odds of Judy surviving more than a few hours were extremely extremely slim but Judy defied all odds and hung on there's no way of putting it though like what she went through was hell she had over 50 surgeries, almost 60 surgeries, 59 surgeries. She had spent seven months in a coma, had multiple skin grafts, and there were times, seven times, where she had essentially died and needed to be resuscitated. She was scarred from head to toe, unable to walk, and could hardly speak because of the damage to her airways that she was burned so bad. And while she is fighting for her life to stay alive, Michael's claims when he speaks to police are that it was an, it was all an accident. He claimed that Judy had gotten gasoline on herself while she was filling the truck up and when she went to go light a cigarette or when he went to light a cigarette for her, she went up in flames. And his proof was that he had also been hurt in the whole process of trying to put the flames out as if he was, you know, 
a hero and a victim himself. I didn't think I got, you know, there, there was that, you know, really she was going to be that. Sure. So she was, I walked over to give her a light. That was it. And then she just... And she, when she went up, I couldn't believe it. I just didn't think that it was going to be like that. Thankfully, there were witnesses there who disputed all of his claims and police were able to also find surveillance from a bank that was next to the gas station. And the this video footage is absolutely gut-wrenching because Michael can be seen pouring the gasoline over Judy's head. He walks off screen for about 30 seconds and then returns and bends over and you see like Judy be set on fire, fully engulfed in flames and in panic, just desperately trying to extinguish them. Not only did they have this surveillance, but they also miraculously had the benefit of Judy being able to potentially help with the investigation. They're just as su surprised as everybody that Judy is awake because never in any of those investigators' careers had they ever seen somebody with the extent of Judy's injuries be alive when they saw them. And because the prognosis of the time that she had left was not on their side. They were wanting to act fast to try to get a statement from Judy. And I learned that this whole process of having Judy speak to police added even more trauma to her because due to her, her condition, she's understandably heavily sedated. So to be able to speak to police and provide a statement that was going to hold up in court, she needed to be out of sedation, which I cannot even imagine. Like when you get a burn on yourself, that pain, you f you don't just like feel it like a cut, you know, like that, oh, let's put a bandaid on and it kind of like subsides over a few minutes or whatever. This is something that you, you feel all that burning all day for, it can be days, weeks sometimes. And that's just like a little, little piece on, on your skin. So to deal with, the, in, the extent of injuries that Judy had and then be having to be taken out of sedation. <sighs> I can't imagine, but she she did it. She was weaned off of her sedation, spoke with investigators. And when they asked if she had accidentally spilled on herself, like Michael had said, she shook her head no. And when she was asked if Michael had done this to her, she shook her head yes. I can only imagine what Michael's thought process would have been when he's confronted with the fact that they're getting information not only from witnesses who he's trying to say like have it all wrong and surveillance, you know, like, oh, it's all it's all wrong, but now Judy herself. But he he maintains that, it, you know, it's not what it looks like. He did at this point once Judy said, you know, like when Judy was able to communicate with police that, okay, yeah, there was an argument. And he said that Judy threw a drink on him first. And all he wanted to do was ruin her clothes because she had ruined his. And so that's why he started dumping gasoline on her. First of all, like so freaking sick. Like eat, let's for one second. Just think that that was even true. Who thinks of that? Who's like, I'm going to put gasoline on you because you you threw pop on me. So that's why he said he did it. Because apparently that's that makes everything better. And he said at some point after this, Judy asks him to bring her a cigarette while she's sitting there. And when he walks over to help her light her, the next thing he knew not her, her cigarette, then she was on fire, which is such a crock of effing crap. And investigators aren't buying it. They believed that, all right, if somebody is drenched in gasoline, their natural instinct would be like, get this off of me, wash this the F off. Like I'm stripping down and probably so scared to even move the wrong way that you're going to like, you know, have some static spark or something and, and you're going to go up in flames like to think like oh yeah I'm covered in gasoline while I'm soaked and sitting here can you please get me a cigarette so yeah wasn't buying Michael's story and not only did they not think that it was wasn't an accident they did believe that his full intentions were 
to kill Judy that day. With that being said, that further complicated the case because they're being told that doctors are expecting Judy to basically pass at any time. So the investigators are left with pretty much just waiting for that to happen and getting their ducks in a row to be able to file murder charges, which again, how unsettling is that? So for weeks, they're waiting. And for weeks, Judy continues just to like beat all of the odds and survives. And so they decide to then charge Michael with aggravated felonous assault, arson, and possession of criminal tools. Michael is all set and ready to go to trial. And then on the morning of jury selection, he pleads no contest and was sentenced to 11 years in prison, which was the maximum for those charges, which is mind-blowing because this creep had just like the most awful history of violence. And Judy's mom, Bonnie, has spoken about this, like not how not only was the sentence such a slap in the face, but what Michael's attorney said the reasoning behind the plea was. And he said that it was basically to preserve Michael's rights in the event of a more serious charge like murder because they are also an- anticipating this could happen in the future. And so by him pleading guilty to the lesser charges that he was being given at that point, point that stopped trial from going forward which would have given Judy an opportunity to testify against him and tell her story which is deplorable because they're like thinking in the future and I get it like I've there is no one that comes harder for me on some of these cases when I talk about defense than defense attorneys wives like y'all are ride or die for your mans that's okay I get that everybody has a job and I know that there are like wonderful defense attorneys out there but it doesn't you know negate the fact that I still get super upset when I hear things like this like yes they are doing their job they are good at it but it is still upsetting when you put yourself in the victim's shoes so uh, yeah handling this whole case would have just been like I don't know I wouldn't I don't think I would have I don't think I would have made it out okay. So with that in mind, knowing that that was the tactic and knowing that, you know, investigators, doctors, prosecutors for the case, even Judy and her family, like they, they're not blind to the fact that Judy is not going to survive this. They're, they're being told all of the time, like this is inevitable. And yes, she's defining odds and holding on, you know, way longer than anybody ever thought in her strength is something that they've never seen but they they knew that this was going to be something that was going to happen and that Michael needed to pay for what he did to her so they all essentially start building a case for future murder charges while their victim is still alive and Judy is so upset as you can imagine when she learns about the sentence that he was given you know 11 years for what he had done she felt like he deserved a life sentence for that arson because what she had gone through was so horrible no human she said should ever go through that no creature should ever have to go through that the pain of being set on fire was what she said was like a life sentence for her judy's mission just became about holding on for her daughters being they were a motivation for her to keep living but she also wanted women everywhere to know her story and learn from it because she never wanted another woman who was in abusive relationship to go through what she did she wanted them to know that if they were in a similar situation to get out find help and get out it is never going to change it's never going to get better and it is it's going to continue to get worse. So what she did while she was alive would start the process of having a new law passed, which was Judy's law. And that would state that offenders who have used an accelerant to harm or disfigure somebody, they would have additional years added to their sentence. So it wouldn't just be that maximum of 11 years. It would be 
additional time on that because she was like, this is like, yes, I'm alive, but I'm living in hell and I'm tortured every day. By January of 2017, Judy herself felt like that she was losing the battle for her life and her time was very limited, but she wanted to be involved in what was going to happen in these next stages. And so prosecutors wanted to do something that had never been done before. They wanted to have Judy pre-record her testimony for her own murder trial. Ultimately, this was going to come down to a, a judge deciding if they were going to allow it when the time came because nothing like that had been done in Ohio at this point and warrior Judy like did not hesitate to give her testimony she truly believed in her heart that when Michael was going to be released after his pathetic 11 year sentence he was going to hurt another woman and thankfully the judge allowed Judy to pre-record a testimony and use it in a pending murder trial in the event of her death which everybody was certain was going to happen but the conditions were that once it was done the testimony was going to be sealed and and put away until it was needed in court there was a point where michael uh found out about this through his attorney and was trying to fight it because he felt like he should be in the room while judy was testifying because he wanted to cross examine her himself but thankfully the judge overruled this motion and said nobody was allowed to be in the room with judy at all while she was giving her testimony which thank freaking goodness because like narcissistic like that like whoo that doesn't even cut it to be to want to be in there and do it. Oh my god, yeah, rage, rage. Like uh, Judy's initial statement to investigators, she again had to endure the agonizing process of spending weeks just being weaned off of her pain medication to prove to the judge that she was of sound mind. Oh my gosh, and the videos of her testimony, like she, you can tell she is just in pain absolutely everywhere this is magistrate elizabeth waters i'm going to swear you in could you please raise your right hand to the extent that you possibly can she's sobbing saying she doesn't know if she could do it but knew that she needed to to do this and get through this testimony so on january 26th from her hospital bed through a speaking valve over her trach Judy gave a three-hour testimony that was recorded over video call. She answered questions from both prosecutor and the defense and testified that Michael's claims that this was an accident was a complete lie. She said never did she accidentally pour gasoline on herself. He had relentlessly poured it all over her. She was covered in head to toe. She spoke about the horrible feeling of having gasoline go down her throat and remember trying to cry out for help and it just like burned so bad. She says she remembered every moment that she was going through it while she was lit on fire, fully believing that those were her last moments and just praying for herself and for her children. Not only does she remember all of those feelings and, and thinking that she was going to die, but she also remembers the look in Michael's eyes. And she said that she was looking at somebody who, who was just empty pure evil there was not an ounce of humanity as he was looking at her when michael's defense got to cross-examine judy the way they went was to focus a lot on her struggles with addiction which is always again something that disturbs me because it tries to make a victim less of a victim because of their hardships and like it's like I don't there's no way to dehumanize somebody unless you're like like the scum of the earth like like somebody who abuses children and animals and old people like because you suffer from addiction should not be something that is used as a tactic to make somebody less 
then. And I mean, let's not forget that that had all started because of her being prescribed heavy narcotics that her body, not her, became dependent on. And even with her being questioned about it, she answered every question with strength and grace and owned up to her flaws and mistakes and showed that humans are are not perfect and that she by no means wanted to imply that she was perfect, but she said, there is nothing that I did in my life that warranted me being drenched in gasoline and purposefully lit on fire. And a freaking man. At the end of her deposition, the prosecutor did ask Judy what she thought should happen to Michael if she were to die from the burns that he inflicted. And Judy, being who everybody who knew Judy described, a woman who always put everybody first and was very understanding and kind, said that she thought Michael should be charged with murder and that he should be given a life sentence, but not a death sentence if that was an option, which I mean, I think right there shows her heart. That's what shows her humanity, not her mistakes. Sadly, a few months after the testimony that Judy gave, after 59 surgeries, 696 days in the hospital, she passed away on June 27th from organ failure. She was next to her mom, holding her mom, and Judy was only 33 years old. Her mom spoke with People Magazine, and oh my gosh, there was a quote in there that ripped my heart apart. She said in those last moments, she told Judy, a part of me is going to go with you when you pass, and a part of you is always going to stay here and live with me, and I am here, and I am holding your hand until Jesus takes your other hand. <sighs> yeah, and she said 10 seconds after that, she she let go of Judy's hand and her, her daughter had passed. I was seeing conflicting reports here, so it was either the day that Judy passed away or the day of her, her funeral the Ohio Senate adopted Judy's law, which is incredible, the law that she was a part of when she was still alive. And two months after Judy died, the governor held a ceremony where he and Judy's two daughters signed Judy's law. And her daughters were only 10 and 13 at the time. And so this law states that an additional six years would be added to the sentence if the offender used an accelerant to harm or disfigure somebody. So it would still be the 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 you know 11 years that were already instilled and then there would be an additional six years added to that which is still I mean it's still upsetting but it's something in the fact that Judy was able to be a part of making a difference and and getting the foot in the door for changes to be made is it's nothing short of a miracle. Once Judy passed and her cause of death was officially ruled to be a result of Michael's attack, he was charged with her murder and he was eligible for the death penalty. But on July 5th, 2018, the day before his trial, Michael took another plea deal where he pleaded guilty to aggravated murder. He admitted to dousing Judy in gasoline and setting her on fire. And as a result of him pleading guilty, the death penalty was taken off of the table and he was sentenced to life without parole. Judy's testimony was played at the hearing, which made her the very first person to ever testify at her own murder trial in Ohio. In Ohio. I don't know why I can't say Ohio. Come on, Sherilyn. Bonnie, Judy's mom, also was able to give a victim impact statement and it was so powerful she just embodies so much strength and I like I look at her and I'm like strength and grace. Like and I think of Judy, I, I've used that term throughout this video, like just grace and strength and I, those those women just fully embody it. And Bonnie made sure that Michael knew the extent of what he did to Judy. She chillingly pointed out that it was almost 700 days that she survived but suffered. She went through 59 surgeries and 90% of her skin was missing on her body. And Bonnie hammered home the agony of what burn victims suffer through, saying that her body wasn't 
you know, just scars. Like it was bloody. It was exposed with her, her raw ligaments and muscle showing. Like what she went through was absolute torture every single day after what he did to her with not a moment of relief until she passed. The judge in this case also spoke to Michael about his plea deal and taking the life sentence, saying that despite all of Judy's suffering, she was the one who had even said in her testimony that she she felt that Michael he deserved a life sentence over a death sentence and that Judy showed more compassion for Michael than he ever showed for her and that should have been given to Michael meaning like you should have got the death penalty bud and so yeah he's he's in southern Ohio correction facility for life and where I hope he gets a UTI every other day for the rest of his life and the rest of eternity in whatever world he goes to when he dies a painful that was dark. I get, I've been getting dark lately at the ends here because I'm just, I've had it. You know how much I've had it is because I'm wearing this sweater that I love so much and I think I've worn, <laughs> worn it once before. I want to wear it every day, but it's got a stain. And I think I got that from like toothpaste or something. Anyways, that's how much I've had it where I'm just like, I don't wear the sweater, Sherilyn. The only positive that I can take from Judy's case is that Judy's family want to ensure that what happened to Judy never happens to another woman. They have created the Judy Malinowski Foundation with its mission to help families and their loved ones who are suffering from drug addiction, domestic abuse, abuse, and human trafficking. And to have all of that encompassed in a foundation is just incredible because so much of that is connected. They are also working on expanding Judy's Law into other states and working with first responders and investigators to develop technology that is going to assist them with dealing with people like Michael, especially when they have repeat offenses. Going back, I it just that it, I think is so incredible to be able to see something like that on hand or have technology, especially for people like Michael who were using the law as an intimidation to hold over Judy. Like he he was using those first responders who were meant to help Judy and using them against her because he was so freaking evil. They're also working on designing and creating Judy's house, which they want to be a safe place for single mom like Judy and her children and to just have somewhere to go if you are in a situation of, you know, trauma and domestic violence they have a website, so you can check it out at www.judysfoundation.org. Come on, Sherilyn. My amazing editors will probably put that on the screen as per usual. Everybody give a shout out to Jay and Kaya. They are the ones who make the magic happen. I think I've asked before, but please do it again. They're the best. Judy's family also has a Facebook page, so please go and check them out over there. Traffic to the websites and to their their Facebook like even just giving a follow and a word of support and love on social media like it it helps so so much everything we do is like a world of the algorithm so and you are a contributing factor of successes I'm gonna have both of those linked in the description below there's also a documentary called the fire that took her it is oh my gosh it is very emotional very raw, powerful. It's very honest and graphic, but it's so important to watch. So I know it's hard to watch is kind of what I'm getting at, but important. Ju uh, Judy's testimony footage of her being in the hospital, her surgeries is obviously the, the most heartbreaking to witness but that's why she did everything she wanted anybody in a similar situation to see themselves in her in that condition and get out and 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 prevent that from happening so 
very important, but very, very difficult to watch. If you or anybody you know is experiencing domestic violence, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. And I hope by sharing these stories, it helps somebody out there know that they are not alone. I hope it also hammers home the severity in your mind that that it can't it can't happen to you that it can happen to you because I think it's so easy to think like oh I don't think it can happen to me or I think a lot of women also second guess themselves thinking you know there's other women out there who have gone through far far worse than I have you know who am I to talk about this or to ask for help you know and nobody no one deserves to be treated like subhuman. No one deserves to be controlled, to be manipulated, degraded, mentally, physically. You 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 do, you don't deserve that. And and just because yes, there are other women who might be experiencing worse abuse than some, all abuse should be treated the same and you don't deserve to be abused. There is never a positive outcome in these situations. I am telling you right now, the amount of excuses you want to make, the things that you want to try to ignore, like it's, it it will never change the very grim truth that if you don't think what happened to Judy can't happen to you and that there are not monsters everywhere out there like Michael, like there are and it can happen to you. I want to leave off with the fact that Judy's hardships did not define her. They did not make her less human or less of a mother or less of a daughter. She saw the light. She wanted to get help for the mistakes that she admitted she had made and she was never given the chance and Michael Slager took that from her. So please go and send her family some inspirational love and support they are incredible humans and if you can share and help their the message of their mission in any way even if you can't donate there is so much that you can do just by sharing and interacting with the things that they post by doing that you are helping to pump out that content to a woman who needs to be seen to see it and and could potentially be saved. I I just always hope that I stress that things like that that you might not think are significant or do much help so so much. So if you're fe- feeling powerless in okay, I'm I'm in, in a financial type situation, that's okay. There are so many things that you can do. Interacting with this video, even sharing it to other places so that more people see it and can go to Judy's family's page um or or just going over there and sharing their page, their foundation. It helps tremendously. So that that is it for me today. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, so, so much. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.